thanks very much for coming. So today's talk is from our very own Beverly Jennings. Um, Beverly, as I think probably all of you know, is a part-time PhD student at the Institute of Education um, and she is doing um, a very interesting uh, PhD on adolescent reading um, and the English GCSE exam that she'll be talking about today. Um, she's also uh, an English uh, teacher, GCSE, well, all different levels of uh, teaching. So she's got these kind of two hats, um, which she's drawing from uh, when she's uh, doing her research. So um, over to you, Beverly. Do you want to share your screen? Thank you. Should be coming up. Now. Yeah, brilliant. And then, yeah, fantastic. OK, over to you. Great, thank you. Um, OK, so um, I'm going to be talking about my research into adolescent reading practices and how I'm using corpus linguistics to think about success in the GCSE English language exam. Um, so thank you to Holly for the little introduction. So you know most of this now. I, so I started in September 2018, which seems such a long time ago now. And if you're part time and I had a suspension for a little while, it's really difficult to work out what year you're in, actually. But I think I'm sort of beginning of the fifth year, so approaching the end. So I'm kind of got um, quite a lot of research to share, but I'm not finished yet. So some of it's still kind of initial findings. Um, so this is just a little bit of the background to my research um, to just those of you who aren't familiar with the kind of the qualifications in England. So exams taken at the end of secondary education when students are 16 years old are called the GCSEs, General Certificate of Secondary Education. And these are really important for students because their results in those um, allow them on to the next step in their education, onto A levels or further education, and you know will be important for their access to higher education as well. And the English language exam with maths, those GCSEs are really important because they're the kind of the two core ones that people have to pass to get onto lots of courses and for a lot of jobs as well. And also it, they're really important qualifications on league tables and for Ofsted. Those are kind of key results that they will look at. So it's quite high stakes, the English language exam. Um, and this is just kind of to tell you the start of my journey. So six or seven years ago, or maybe even eight, I was an examiner for a GCSE English language exam. And there was a story about a girl staying in a hostel in Australia. And there was a lot of description of the really dirt, dirty conditions, especially in the bedroom and the bathroom. Um, and there was a useless manager who just let any old people come to the party. So it wasn't very safe. And this girl's mum arrives at the hostel for a surprise visit and is really angry at the conditions. Um, and I was sitting marking hundreds and hundreds of papers on my screen as an examiner. And a, a really large number of students were really struggling to show um, that they understood the motivations of the mum and why the mum was complaining. And um, it was really difficult to understand why they were confused with this. It seemed quite simple to me that the mum would arrive and would be unhappy if the hostel wasn't providing good accommodation. And then one of the answers actually explained what the issue is, that one of the candidates wrote that she really didn't understand why the mum had the right to complain and be angry, because it must be partly her fault that this girl is in a homeless hostel. And then that kind of was the light bulb moment for me. These students were struggling to understand the story and show empathy and understanding with the character in the story because their understanding of the word hostel was that it was a homeless hostel or temporary or emergency accommodation. And therefore the anger and complaint of the mum didn't make sense because they didn't have access to this meaning that a hostel could also mean cheap holiday accommodation. Um, and so that kind of highlighted for me the importance of vocabulary knowledge and kind of set me off on my journey of wanting to find out more about that and and starting the PhD to kind of look into reading comprehension and vocabulary. So I suppose this is where vocabulary is not just a yes, no answer. It's not just whether you know the word. These students knew the word hostel and they thought that they understood the meaning of it. But what they didn't realise that there was another meaning that they didn't have access to. Um, and so in order to kind of access the text properly and comprehend it fully, they needed to have a nuanced view of that word, know that there are multiple meanings and select the correct one kind of from their bank of words. 
So I started using um, a, a corpus linguistics to kind of explore this and see what the issue was with this word hostile. So I looked in the British National Corpus first, which is a really big reference corpus, and hostel has a frequency per million of words of 7.44. So not horribly um, unusual word, not very, very low frequency. Um, other words with that type of frequency are melody, revert, eternal and goose. So it's not a really unusual word. Um, so therefore, it shouldn't really have been a problem to students. But then when I looked at modifiers that were relating to this noun of hostel, um, what I saw was that actually a lot of the modifiers gave more of the meaning that these students were accessing of kind of emergency or temporary accommodation um, than the holiday, cheap holiday accommodation one. So you've got the words in blue, bail hostel, salvation, army hostel, probation hostel, migrant hostel, council run hostel, all of those meanings kind of that emergency accommodation. And there was just the one modifier for a youth hostel that linked to that kind of cheap holiday accommodation. And then when I explored that further, the most frequent genre for that um, meaning of youth and hostel were in magazines. Well, I don't know about any of you, but no, not many young people I know read magazines. So the chance of coming across that meaning from a magazine are going to be quite slight. So then I looked in some other reference corpora to kind of see where different meanings of hostel could be found. And um, there's one called English Web 2013. So it's a sample of websites in English taken in 2013, just put into a corpus that you can search. And so that gave more of the uh, meanings for holiday accommodation. You had backpackers hostel, youth hostel, or, or having it with a hotel, meet to mean a hotel. So I think if you were looking to book a holiday online, then you're going to have access to that meaning of the word, aren't you? But I'm not sure how many people who maybe don't go on holiday or have never booked a holiday would have come across those websites and that meaning. Also looked in um, English broadsheet newspapers. And again, lots of modifiers that suggest the meaning of the word, meaning kind of emergency or temporary accommodation or the blue ones rather than the green ones kind of for youth or backpacker, meaning um, cheap holiday accommodation. And the other place where I found the meanings for holidays was in Project Gutenberg, which is out of copyright, most of them anyway, literary text. So it seemed that they're very particular places where you think or things that you'd have to be reading to have got that meaning of, of holiday. You'd have to be booking holiday online, reading magazines, um, maybe finding it in a minority in newspapers or reading older literary fiction. Now, I suppose this is just one word, isn't it? It's not going to come up in every single exam. So, I mean, how much of a fuss should I be making about hostel? But for me, it kind of demonstrates how important vocabulary knowledge is to comprehension, because I had that really kind of um, intense experience of lots and lots and lots of exam papers where they were scoring really lowly, uh, low on the scale because they just that one word was misunderstood. And it's also kind of shown me how previous experiences with words can impact our understanding of them. So if you come from a, the kind of place where there are more likely to be emergency, where there's more likely to be emergency accommodation than holiday accommodation, then you're more likely to know that meaning of hostel rather than the holiday one. Um, so I think it kind of showed me that background and where you live and social circle and all those kind of things is going to impact what meaning of a word that you know. And where we experience words can be really important to our knowledge of them. So that kind of led me to think about source text. What do we need to read or what do I need to be thinking about students reading in order for them to experience the right meanings of words so that, that they're going to need for their exams? So I've been working with two main theories of reading. Um, lexical quality hypothesis, which is um, looks at the efficient processing of a word depending on understanding the words quickly and accurately and that speed and accuracy only being possible if we've encountered those words multiple times before in varied contexts. So again that importance of reading experience and um, experiencing words many many times over but in different ways and also works with lexical legacy theory um, which again 
emphasises past reading experience and looks at how past reading experience affects current reading ability. So unless your previous reading has provided you with adequate preparation for the thing that you're reading right now in front of you, your success is severely compromised. So that kind of led me to think about prior reading and reading experience um, for my research. Oh, I should I was going to do a trigger warning that I've put a picture of Michael Gove. Apologies if anyone is upset by this. But in 2013, when he was education secretary, the Department of Education decided to reform the GCSE exams. And this has really changed the, the kind of the landscape for English teaching and the English curriculum. So um, they decided to remove the tiers. So you used to be able to enter students for a foundation tier if you kind of were predicting that they were going to get um, a C or below. And that would give them maybe more accessible texts and questions that would allow them to do the best they could. And then um, there was a higher tier which would take you to C and upwards. And again, that was then designed to enable students to kind of get to the higher grades by giving them higher challenge. Um, but those tiers were removed. So now all students sit exactly the same paper and have to access all the grades from the same questions. And there was also a change to the grading structure. So we now talk about grades nine to one rather than A to G for GCSE. So nine is the top grade and one is the bottom grade. And the aim of the new qualification that was designed was that students would be able to read a wide range of texts fluently and with good understanding. And it was to make the course more engaging and worthwhile to teach and study and to prepare students better for their future. So that was kind of the aim that Ofqual put out in 2013. And I'm going to kind of challenge whether that has been achieved or not really through what I found out. So this is just a little bit of a diagram, the one on the left that right way around. The one on the left is the old um, assessment. So we actually had 20% of the mark used to be for uh, giving a speech and group work, 40% was coursework, and then only 40% was in the exam. Whereas now we just go to 100% exam and unseen reading comprehension moves from being worth 20% to being worth 50%. So just there's there's much more emphasis on the ability to comprehend unseen texts for success in this qualification. So just to give you a little picture, um, in the old specification, the foundation tier might read text like this, recipes, um, maybe uh, a page from an information book that's quite accessible, you know, in little sections with subtitles and pictures again. Whereas now what you get is just no pictures, just simply paragraphs of text and with these kinds of authors. So right from the 19th century to the 21st century. Um, but this little um, gallery gives you a kind of a picture of the kind of authors. So we've got more men than women. Um, if you look, there's very little kind of ethnic or racial diversity there. So it's, it's kind of swinging back to a, a much more traditional and narrow curriculum. So the kind of typical text that we'd find in the specification we teach now is in the fiction paper. They might get uh, an extract from Hound of the Baskervilles or Crime and Punishment. And in the non-fiction paper, you might get a Guardian newspaper article about volcanoes um, where, or a 19th century letter about surfing. Um, Monday's exam was the non-fiction exam just a few days ago, and I think they had two non-fiction extracts about trains, one written in the 19th century and one in the 21st century. So. That's the kind of thing that we get. So just to kind of summarise the background to my research project, there's been a change in the landscape of assessment for this really important gateway qualification. Unseen reading comprehension has become much more important, moved from 20% to 50%. Um, there's the challenge of a one tier linear exam for all students, no, no tiered entry anymore. And from a kind of a um, theoretical point of view, vocabulary is key to comprehension. And it depends on knowledge built over prior experience with the words. And for me, the location or sources of that prior experience, finding out where those words can be experienced has been absolutely key to what I've been doing. So these are the kind of research questions that I've been asking myself. And then it's my project is split into kind of three parts over on the right there in the boxes. So I'm asking what is the typical vocabulary of the English language GCSE exam text? 
where is this vocabulary most likely to be found? So what are the likely source texts? And I've covered that in the first part of my research with a corpus created from the exam text. And then the third question is, what are students' current reading habits? And is there a relationship between what they read and their GCSE results? And that was covered in the second part by a student survey. And then my final question is, does the vocabulary that students encounter at school and in their independent reading match the vocabulary in the exam? And for that, I've created um, two more student reading corpora. So I, this is the first part um, of my research, the exam text corpus. So I collected all the available um, extracts from the English new English language exam and put them together into a corpus. So that was 59 documents, about 36 and a half thousand words, and used Sketch Engine to kind of analyze that collection of documents. Um, just to give show you how it was kind of made up, we've got, if you look at the totals there, 19 documents of fiction. Um, 40 documents for non-fiction, so we've got mostly non-fiction, two-thirds of it is non-fiction, this becomes important later. And then across the centuries, which um, the government specified or the um, Ofqual specified that there must be texts from the 19th, the 20th and the 21st century. So you can see the extracts I've got are spread evenly across those three centuries. I think I just had copyright issues with the 21st century for a couple of things, which meant it dropped one or two below the others. And um, so I created my corpus and then used the tool in Sketch Engine to compare my exam text corpus with lots of other reference corpora. And it then gives you a number that shows how alike the um, your, my corpus, the exam text corpus, is to these reference ones. And the smaller the number, the more alike the corpora are. So my corpus was most like, out of this list, Project Wittenberg English, which is older literary text, which is kind of what I found with hostel, wasn't it? That was older literary text that was a match for it, but not just for the word hostel now, for the whole exam text corpus. And um, they were my exam text corpus was least like websites and spoken language corpora. So that just gave me uh, kind of an initial finding about what a good match for the type of reading in the exam looks like, and it looks like older literary texts according to this. And then I use corpus linguistics tools to identify keywords. So keywords represent the typical vocabulary in an exam text, and the sketch engine calculates what your keywords are for you. Um, and I use the British National Corpus as a reference corpus. And then I just explored those keywords to see where what types of source text they would most they would um, most likely to be found. So just to give you a little sample of of all the keywords, uh, these this is a, um, so we've got a few nouns there. Things like breaker, thrill, boulder, napkin. I mean cravat, very old fashioned, isn't it? Napkin's got a couple of meanings. If you know the US meaning, then that's going to be different to the UK meaning as well. So that could cause a bit of a problem, maybe. Got some some easy adjectives, but some that are quite unusual. Giddy is quite an old fashioned word, I think, isn't it? Um, gobble is a great verb that came up there. And I think majestically is my favourite adverb on there. That's one that's quite often misunderstood by students as well to, to kind of guess what is meant by something that's being described as moving majestically, maybe. So looking at these keywords in the British National Corpus, these are frequency per million counts. So they kind of just look at the, that, that kind of averages it out no matter what size the, the um, corpora are. So if we look at the kind of top arrow, the keywords were far more likely to be found in written text than in spoken transcripts in the British National Corpus. So you've got 4.76 compared to 2.92. So for, far more frequency per million for the written text. And then looking at the kind of um, sub corpora of the written, we've got an imaginative sub corpus and an informative sub corpus and far higher figure frequency per million for the um, imaginative sub corpus than for the informative. So it's highest in imaginative text or fiction. So again, that kind of supports the Project Wittenberg finding from before.
And then I looked at the David Lee categories and the David Lee categories break it down even further. So instead of just saying spoken and written and fiction uh, and um, imaginative and informative, you've got 24 spoken categories, for example, broadcast documentary, classroom talk, parliamentary um, transcripts and just unscripted speech conversations that they recorded. You've got 46 written categories ranging from kind of academic language and in, in different subcategories, maybe poetry, newspapers, religious texts. So really kind of breaking down all the source texts in the British National Corpus into much smaller categories. So the, the frequencies are calculated slightly differently here. It talks about relative frequencies. So if you get the number 100, it shows that um, it's about the same for this category as it would be for the whole corpus. That under 100, it means that the words are less likely to be found in that category. Over 100 means that they're more likely to be found in that category than in the corpus as a whole. So this is just a sample of the spoken language categories. And you can see for most of them, they're under 100. And in fact, for all the totals in the final column, they're under 100. So this, again, supports what was indicated in earlier findings that it, um, spoken language is not a rich source for the keywords. So if you don't read anything, you're not going to have come across the words that come, that come up in the exam. And these are, this is, again, a sample of David Lee categories for the written. I've kind of picked where the highlight is in the middle there. So we've got far more categories where it's over 100 for the written than the spoken, which we would expect from the earlier finding. And the green and dark green numbers kind of cluster around where it's highest, cluster around poetry and prose fiction. Um, so it's showing that um, poetry in particular came up really high, but we have to be careful because it's probably quite a small category. Um, and, but it's kind of showing as indicated in earlier findings, that the keywords are far more likely to be found in kind of fictional and imaginative text. I think poetry maybe has something around it with kind of choice of unusual words um, to fit in with rhythm and meter and things like that that are then coming up in the exam. So to sort of summarise the first part of my research for the exam text corpus. The key words were low frequency words, the vast majority of them. So that would present quite a high challenge to all the students taking the exam. The clo closest reference corpus match was Project Gutenberg, older literary fiction. And supporting that, when I looked at the key words, they were mostly found in written imaginative text, so prose fiction and poetry. So that, that's kind of a theme that's come up more than once. So just to you remember that table at the beginning, if you remember two thirds or 40 out of 59 of the exam texts were non-fiction. And yet the source texts for the vocabulary are fiction. So that's kind of a little bit of a mismatch compared to what you'd expect. If we know the students are getting two thirds of the texts of non-fiction, you might think it would be better preparation to read non-fiction. But yet here, actually, the better preparation looks like it's in fiction text. And it's older literary fiction that's coming up in Project Gutenberg, when remember there was an even spread across the three centuries. So it seems there's something in the choice of the kinds of text for the exams that seems to be meaning that the words are found in older fiction texts rather than representing um, more superficially the non-fiction and the spread of the different centuries. So to go on to the second part of my um, research now, I wanted to find out what students were actually reading to see if it was going to match what I was finding out they needed to be reading. So I had a, an online survey using Survey Tool Redcap. Uh, most of my respondents came from a large sixth form college in the southeast of England. I tried really, really hard to get SE colleges to circulate the survey as well, you know, wrote to lots and lots of them. Only one agreed to circulate it, and, and even when they did, there was only one response. So it's really hard to get a range of replies, and you'll see that kind of from my descriptive statistics in, in a minute. So by far the most um, respondents were identified as female. Um, I, I asked if people got free school meals or pupil premium, which is a measure of disadvantage used by schools and 
the vast majority said no to that question. Um, I also asked for postcodes and of those who gave the postcode, the vast majority are at the least disadvantaged end of the scale. So one, which got no respondent, was is the most deprived um, decile and 10 is the least deprived. So you can see that everyone is kind of at this least deprived end of the scale where they gave their postcode. Also asked for ethnicity, um, and obviously got dominant for white. This probably reflects the, um, the college that where most of the respondents came from pretty accurately, actually, that thread. Um, and they came from two year groups, obviously stick from colleges and we've got two years in them. So um, some of the cohort had taken their exams in 2019, which was pre COVID, where they actually sat a proper GCSE exam like I was describing at the beginning. But then um, I had another cohort, slightly more, who replied in the younger year, who took their GCSEs in 2020, which was during COVID, where they didn't sit an exam. The teachers or the centres, the school, assessed their work holistically and um, gave them a grade. So there was no unseen comprehension. So this is kind of the COVID implication for my work. My project is really much based on an exam. And obviously, I had two years when no exam was taken. So I've had to work around that COVID problem with the way I'm analysing my results. So these were the grades that the respondents said that they got. So you can see you get two very different patterns for the two different years. 2019, you kind of get a bit more of a peak at grade six, which is about a B on in old money. Um, whereas in 2020, you can see that it kind of peaks at grade seven and eight and nine are kind of really high as well. And that's just because of the way that the grades were awarded. The schools awarded the grades. The government tried to kind of impose a bit of a bell curve on it. And there was an uproar about that. And so the original grades were retained. So you've got much higher grades given in 2020 than in 2019. But overall, if you look at it, all my respondents are, are, are very high achieving. I've got none down in the kind of three, two, one sections, barely any getting fours. You know, everyone is up in the higher end because it was a sixth form college. And because of this pattern of the results, I have analysed um, all the other measures differently for 2019 than for 2020, because you just really can't compare these two sets of grades because they were awarded in completely different ways. So overall, I've got survey respondents that are majority are female, the majority are white, the majority are privileged and the majority are high achieving, which I know if we were kind of setting a target for the group of students we would be aiming for, we would not have had any of those on the list. So I'm kind of saying I've completely missed the target there with that. But I think I've just got sampling bias, haven't I? And I really love this little cartoon where everyone who returned um, the survey said they loved responding to surveys. And I think if I'm sending around an email saying, please answer these questions about reading, I'm, what I've got is the people who love reading or who are good at reading or who, who feel positive about reading are responding. And then that has kind of skewed my results. But I just have to say that that's what I've got and bear that in mind. Um, so there were two sections of reading questions on the survey that students responded to. Um, lots that were self-reported, so I asked them about their time spent reading, how much they enjoyed reading compared to others, the types of genres that they chose to read, and all these were really interesting information. Well, for me as a teacher, it was really interesting um, to, to see what people read, but there were no statistical relationships with any of those self-reported measures and the GCSE grades that respondents said that they had attained. And then the second set of reading questions um, were more objective reading measures. So I had an author recognition test and a vocabulary test. And the scores on those, there is a relationship to the GCSE grade that respondents said they got. So I'm going to focus on those um, today. Although just a little bit of information about the reading, because I think it's interesting. When I asked, what do you most read in college? And they only got one choice. The vast majority said they read information books. So therefore, the fiction reading must be happening at home, because then what I asked them, what do you read for pleasure? That's where the kind of modern fiction really took over from the information books. Um, so 
thinking about it from a practitioner point of view, it's really interesting to know that the type of reading that they're going to need for their the vocabulary that's in the exam is the type of reading that's happening at home, not the type of reading that's happening in school, according to the survey. So an author recognition test, if you um, haven't heard of those before, it's uh, an objective measure of print exposure and respondents identify names from a list that they know are authors. Um, so the idea is the more they read, the more authors they will know. And the score is calculated so they get a point for each correctly identified author and then minus any um, in foils or incorrect names that they identified. So this was a uniquely designed auto recognition test for this survey. I put on 25 young adult authors, so people like Anthony Horowitz, Mallory Blackman, and then had 25 classic or curriculum authors. So the English literature authors that are on the curriculum and any of the authors that had been used in the past for the exam text in the English language exam. So the idea that's kind of representing what's covered in the English curriculum and then made up 50 kind of matching foils. I'll just give you a little sample if you want to test yourself. So this is one of the list of 10. The students would have to tick which of these do you know are real authors? Have a look and see if you recognize any real authors on there. And now we'll move on and give you the answers. Very difficult to judge the time when I can't see you. Right, so uh, there are five real authors on that list. Um, J.B. Priestley was a curriculum author, wrote Inspector Calls, which is most children's study for literature. J.K. Rowling, of course, I hope you all recognise her. Jacqueline Wilson is on that list as young adult authors. Jane Austen should have been a name you would hope lots of people recognise. Jason Reynolds is a, uh, a very um, recent contemporary a young adult author. And then you've got three more foils at the bottom. So that would they had 10 lists like that to go through and tick. Um, so I've kept the years separate due to the COVID GCSE awarding method, and I grouped them into whether they got a mid grade, grade four to six, or a high grade, and then looked at the relationship between that and their ARP score. So what we've got is in 2019, the mid grade group. Um, had the lower mean art score than the high grade group and the mid grade group in 2020 had a lower mean art score than the high grade group. So I do have a relationship um, between those things. I have started to look at the separate list for the young adult author scores and the classic or curriculum author scores. I'm not quite ready to share that analysis yet, but it's looking like that the relationship between GCSE group is, is stronger for the um, curriculum author score. So that's supporting all the earlier findings as well, that it's that kind of classic older literary fiction um, that, that's correlated to the exam. Not correlated, can't say that, relationship to the exam. And then they had some vocabulary questions, so I picked 15 of the keywords and I kept them in their sentences that they were in in the exam text. Um, so, for example, I, I was asking which answer is nearest in meaning to the word in italics. So the key word is breakers. They swam out to the first line of breakers and then diving down with being no more. Um, the correct answer being waves. That was got quite a low score overall. Lots of students didn't know that. And again, we've got this relationship in 2019. The mid grade group got lower average vocabulary scores than the high grade group. And in 2020, the mid grade group got lower average vocabulary scores and high grade groups. And again, that's a, a strong relationship. So just to sum up the survey initial findings, I'm still writing this up. So these are just initial findings, but there seems to be a relationship between the art scores and the GCSE grade groups. And it looks like there's the strongest relationship is between the classic art score um, and the GCSE grade groups. Um, which supports the findings, you know, the Project Gutenberg ones and the kind of poetry and, and fiction finding from the uh, corpus study at the beginning. There's also a relationship between the vocabulary scores and the GCSE grade um, groups, which is great for me because I've been focused on vocabulary. So it's nice to see that that's kind of a strong relationship as well. Also, what was interesting was that school and college was mostly providing nonfiction, which we know is not a good source for the kind of exam text vocabulary and fiction is mostly read at home. So that's important for practitioners to kind of be thinking about. 
And on to the third and kind of shortest, because I haven't done so much on this section. Um, so this is creating a student reading corpus. So to try and see what students actually read and how that relates to the um, to the exam text itself. So I collected reading materials from year 10 lessons for a week in June. I got access to Google Classrooms, which is a platform where teachers share all the resources with the students and downloaded everything on the Google Classroom for that week. So there were textbook pages, slides, worksheets, some tests just some instructions about tasks and poems um, and just kind of made all that into a curriculum corpus. And then I also took some year 10 students independent re reading choices from a half term holiday to kind of represent reading at home. So I asked the students just to tell me what they'd read after telling them that they needed to read over half term. So just to give a little taste, I had three Harry Potters, a couple of autobiographies, a couple of um, students just said they just read about football, so a couple of sports articles. Twilight was on the list. The Great Gatsby was on the list. Biggles, that was a surprise to me, and the BFG. So a real range. It was a mixed ability year 10 class, a real range to kind of represent a snapshot of um, reading for pleasure, basically. So I haven't done very much with these two new corpora that I've made yet, but what I have done is just compare them to um, the exam text corpus like I did all the reference cor corpora like at, right at the beginning and this is where they slot in so the students independent reading kind of comes in here so not as good a match to the exam text corpus as project Gutenberg um, and other written ones so obviously I have to remember that's a very small corpus and it's just um, uh, probably under 20 books but what's interesting is it's still better match then the curriculum reading corpus, which is right down here, just because having looked at it of all the technical language, I think I've got, you know, stuff from science and technology and computing and things like that. So it's really not like the kinds of um, text that you get in the exam at all. So um, I think that knowing that what students are reading in lessons is really not a good match for what comes up in their English language exam is quite an interesting finding. Um, I was on a course the other week as the literacy coordinator at my school and was told by the person running the course that the English language exam is a test of students reading in their other subjects. So that's kind of quite a commonly held belief. But what my research says is actually what they're reading in other lessons doesn't, doesn't match the English language exam very well at all. I'm clicking and nothing is happening. Don't know why that's not moving on. I think I'm near the end anyway. I might just stop sharing because my slides aren't moving and then go in again. Yeah, maybe stop sharing and reshare. Oh, it's just gone. Can you still see it like that now? Yeah. OK, so it's literally my last just two slides. So overall, just to sum up everything I've said so far, um, the stated aim of that new English language GCSE that was, was thought up in 2013 and then came in and started to be taught in 2015 was that students would have to read a wide range of texts. And I think what my research has shown is actually what in the exam doesn't depend on their reading of a wide range of texts. It's very much centred on older literary fiction. Um, it's meant to prepare them for the next steps in their education and employment. But actually, it doesn't match all the other subjects reading very much at all, does it? So it's, it's kind of not matching what they might go on to read in more specialist areas. And at the moment, it's taken kind of as this general measure of literacy ability for jobs and for courses. But it seems to be pretty much duplicating what is on the English Literature GCSE if it's very focused on older literary texts. So I think there's a big issue of diversity and representation there because of the nature of the literature canon. You know, it tends to be very Eurocentric, what's taught, um, very male and um, very kind of middle class. So it's a real shame that that kind of lack of diversity and representation is going to be repeated in a second kind of GCSE. And just think about who gets to experience the right meaning of hostel. You know, if you've got family and friends, you go backpacking. Think about what social circles that happens in. If you go on holiday, if you kind of are reading older literary texts and it, it's kind of a worry that there's this perpetuation of privilege going on in the English language exam. 
So that's the end of my presentation. I haven't done too bad time wise today, I think. Uh, thank you to my supervisors, obviously Holly and Daisy, and um, just to acknowledge that Sylvia from the um, language department has really helped me with my corporate stuff as well. So I stop sharing, Holly. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you, Beverly. That was. Fantastic. Even though obviously I know your research very well, I always find it really interesting to hear you talk about it. So um oh, applause from Christos there, thank you. Uh, Anna, have you got um a question? I do. Thank you ever so much, Beverly. This was really very, very interesting. Um and a very different way of looking at what is taught in schools, but also what is assessed in schools. And um, I know you've primarily, perhaps you primarily highlighted that this is high stakes exams. And um, so this is interesting. One of the main reasons why this is interesting is that. But um, I wanted to ask what your view is based on what you've done so far on what the Department for Education wants the, these children to be prepared to learn when they leave secondary education. Um, the impression I got from what you saw, uh, you, you, the results you shared, is that they are preparing um, children in different areas of the curriculum to be well updated on recent um, developments on technology um, and, and science and things like that. But then when it comes to testing how prepared they are for um, the modern world, um, the vocabulary, the texts that are used relate to the 19th and 20th century. So what do, what do you think in terms of the scaling um, of, of those children? What do you think that your results tell us? I think there's a bit of a mismatch, isn't there? Because what they kind of said they wanted was this kind of wide range of texts and preparing students for their future and then when you actually look at what the assessment does and obviously what the assessment does completely affects the curriculum leading up to that assessment is that that, that kind of a mismatch isn't it so there's lots of calls sometimes that obviously we would hope that we're teaching students to recognize fake news you know to know what's believable and what isn't believable and um, we're preparing them for a world where an awful lot of information is online and you'd hope that we would be teaching them to kind of recognise good and bad things on social media. And all that is kind of a language education, isn't it? It's linguistics and those kind of things. And yet none of that is tested in the assessment. So I think there was a bit of a mismatch when they were designing it between an aspiration that kind of gets um, accredited to go to, to have a really academic, rigorous, challenging, traditional education. And a lot of people at the time were saying, He's just remembering his own grammar school education and, and redoing it. So you've kind of, which is what you can see in the text from the 19th century and has to be literary and all this. And then actually what the aspiration is for how, for how students come out the other end. So I suppose I would come out of my research and say, I should be telling teachers, you need to be getting students to be reading more older literary fiction if you want them to know the words in the exams. But then that sits badly with me because then I'm promoting a really non-diverse, unrepresentative curriculum and not doing any of the things that would prepare students well for their future. So you've got a mismatch between yeah. the two. Yes. Um, and I don't know how that works across the whole curriculum. This is very much focused on, on the English language exam. But I mean, I'm sure that that's the, the same. I know other subjects have had real trouble with these new specifications because the content is so high squeezed into you know a really small amount of time and they feel they don't get to develop time to develop the skills because they're just cramming in so much content so I think there is that mismatch yeah yeah and but I also think that there is great um there, there's room for you to contribute to them changing um the exams so in an ideal world you could present this evidence and say look your exams are mm -hmm. are not what you what, what you think they are and I think there's a bit of a crisis in um, the kind of English um, academic recruitment at the moment for undergraduates in English. And a lot of teachers believe that the course at GCSE is putting students off going on to study it later. Although there's also you know, other reasons for, for that might be true, too. Well, that's interesting because it, this recent data out, I think, saying that in Scotland, more and more people are studying English 
but in England that's going down. So do you know if Scotland has a more kind of diverse curriculum or? Yeah, or maybe or, or the other thing I saw about that was that you don't pay for your education in Scotland. Yeah. So maybe you feel freer to choose a yeah. subject you enjoy rather than you're compelled to choose a subject yeah. that you feel will be worth the money that or the debt that you're going to acquire. So there's those two things going yeah. on. But yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, Daisy, have you got a question? Hi, thanks, Beverly. Really, really <laughs> nice talk. Um, and I should really know this stuff, having discussed it with you before, but it's this issue of keywords. And I know I've asked you about this before. So keywords are basically words that occur more frequently in your corpus than they would in the British, in, in whatever a reference corpus you choose to compare it to. Okay. So I chose the British National Corpus because it I felt it had the biggest range of sources, spoken and written language, um, whereas a lot of other reference corpora just focus on one thing. So they're just websites yeah. or just spoken language or just written language. But so do you set the do you set the criteria? So do you say I want you to find me like 10 keywords from each of the passages or no, it compares regardless to, of what their actual raw frequency is relative. Um, to... I think it kind of says that they represent these keywords are taken to represent my corpus because they occur in my corpus more frequently than they would occur in the BMC, which I'm taking to represent kind of general language use. So they're kind of. Um, yeah, more frequent in the corpus than you would expect in general language. And so therefore they just represent the corpus. But isn't they're it typical also of the corpus. You, said, you said they're low frequency, which tells us something about the text that these kids are having yeah. to read, which means they've got to know all of these kind of low frequency words. But isn't it also just by nature of how they're detected they're quite likely so I think to be if, I, if I recorded lots of conversations in the playground and had them yeah. all in a transcript and called that playground conversation corpus and then compared it to the BNC you would have all the high frequency words probably as your keywords there because high frequency words are going to be far more are going to appear in that corpus of playground talk far more than they appear in general language so what you should get is you know yeah. what do, do yeah. you see that? that yeah, so, so they can you know, still be high frequency, they're just higher frequency than they are in, yeah. Yeah, does that yeah, explain so it a little bit better using okay. that yeah. example, yeah. 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 So I no, think, so, you know, kind of slang words and ands, you know, because we say and, 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 and far more in spoken language than we do in written language. So therefore, in a purely spoken language corpus, I might expect kind of connectives and things like that to be keywords yeah. if I was yeah. comparing them to something that was a written corpus. Yeah. And when you looked at those keywords, um, I'm, it's really, I'm just wondering how kind of useful those are just on that basis in terms of describing the types of passages that the kids are reading because and how well they're likely to do on those passages. Mm. And given that they're supposed to represent the passages in some way, did you get the sense that they were the types of words that were going to be kind of fundamental to the whole understanding of the whole passage? Were, or or well, was suppose, it more coincidental than that? Well, I suppose the keyword is a is a quantitative thing, isn't it? So they're yeah. just it's just on a numbers thing. But I think it would be really interesting to look at the passages, maybe more kind of qualitatively yeah. and analytically. And what was interesting when I was um, looking at the keywords themselves is that you know lots of clothing came up and lots of words to do with kind of travel and adventure. And yeah. so you do start to get a sense from them about typical. Um, narratives that are chosen for the exams you know something about people useful <laughs> yeah because well they, they need to choose things that you're going to be able to analyze that are going to be interesting so you you are it, it would be another way of looking at the text I think to do more of a qualitative analysis of the language maybe a bit more discourse analysis mm -hmm. and just look at the kind yeah. of things that are coming up keywords is very much a numbers thing it's meant yeah. to show me on a statistical level which words are more frequent in my corpus than in a reference corpus yeah and therefore represent the corpus in that way but I think yeah looking at it and just kind of thinking well what kinds of texts and stories and situations is a is another interesting level to them so do, yeah. you, do you know if sorry do you know if um when they're deciding on what text to include if they think about the kind of 
general topic? I mean, I know there's been controversy around SATs in year six and how the, the topic itself has seemed to be, you know, very middle class or not accessible for some students from certain backgrounds. Do you know if that's something that goes into the kind of exam yeah, I think design. they I think they sometimes say that they've chosen topics in the exam board report, the examiner's report. They'll kind of say we've chosen a topic that was would have been equally unknown to everybody. Okay. You know? Yeah. But there was one year where surfing was the topic. Now yes. you can't tell me that people in Cornwall yeah. weren't advantaged by mm. that. If you live on the coast in Cornwall, you might know about more about surfing. You would have recognized some of the descriptions of the board more than someone who maybe lived in mm. an inner city and doesn't get to the beach and surf. Yeah, and yeah. Um, uh, I think the one of the writing questions um, straight after the pandemic was to write about the benefits of traveling, and a lot of you know teachers on Twitter afterwards are up in arms saying some of our kids have never been on holiday. They certainly haven't been away in the last couple of years, you know. And if you have gone on holiday or travelled or know people who travel, it's like my hostel example. So I think probably there are the same concerns about the GCSE English language exam as there are about that in, in about accessibility to the passage. And, and, you know, it's about privilege, isn't it? Mm. Uh, and what's being chosen and what the assumption is about knowledge. Yeah. There's obviously an assumption that, you know, a hostel is a cheap holiday accommodation without thinking about everyone and everyone's experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess reading older literary fiction could be seen to be a sort of a, a leveller in the sense that at least that way, whatever your background, if you can mm -hmm. get your hands on a book and read it, that could potentially give you um, access. Um, yeah. Just a comment from Suzanne. Um, OK, yeah, Suzanne says it's very similar to what happens in MFL exams. Um, pupils being asked to write about a ski holiday yeah 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 it's interesting isn't it? I mean it's an impossible task in a way isn't it to try and create an exam that is equally you know accessible to all students and the reality is that we you know live in a society that's very hierarchical etc but yeah it's good to talk about these things right I think we better uh, wrap up because it's nearly five two thank you so much Beverly I forgot to say my introduction as I meant to Beverly won the three minute thesis competition yesterday at the yeah. university <laughs> you got it ready um so yes that was a longer version um uh, of her talk and a bit extra as well so thank you very much and um hopefully you'll come back and talk to us when you've finished your phd and you can give us a kind of everything in um talk and um our next sound talk is next month it's betty you i think it's 17th of july but obviously i'll be emailing etc before then um so thanks everyone and see you next time thank you